So good morning. I'm obviously not here today. Now, I'm doing this video because if I ask my substitute teacher to do this, I'm not saying he or she could or could not. What I want you to understand as a young person and to apply to your life in the next six and a half years, substitute teaching is a very difficult job. I did it when I was a college student. I did it for a couple months before I got hired as a second grade teacher 21 years ago, which seems like forever ago. It's not easy at all because you don't know these students, you don't know what makes them work or how it makes, you know, things would go. And sometimes there were issues that I was asked to teach that I didn't understand at all. Understanding binomial nomenclatures would be a very difficult thing for any substitute teacher coming into my classroom unless they specialized in biology and identifying and classifying organisms. So hopefully this will make your life easier because you'll be able to have me teaching you even though I'm not physically here. You're not wasting 25 minutes of your time coming in and trying to read your science book which for some of you is more difficult and challenging than others. But I wanted you to be able to get the information. Plus, those people who are sick, as we found in my math class, it lets them access today's lesson without having to be here at school and they're not going to be falling behind. We're going to be looking at the classification of life and how things are diverse. That's what the title of the first or the second section talks about. We're going to be using this piece of paper. So, if you have not gotten this piece of paper yet, from over here where my Kleenexes are, on top of the newly copied science fair packets, which if you haven't gotten one, you can get one as well. Then please get this now and don't fill it out until I ask you to. Pause your video, go get it, come back, hopefully you have it, going on. So the way I teach classification life is using a saying, once again, a mnemonic device. Now I started the science year with a mnemonic device when it came to the science um, met scientific method. The scientific method is queens in Hawaii receive treasures and chocolates. There are seven steps to the scientific method. Those type of steps you need to know to do them in that order as you're doing your science fair project, which is due April the 10th. I'm going to teach classification of life using the mnemonic device of let's do keep plates clean or family gets sick. Now what that actually stands for is all the steps for classifying life. Life, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now notice on the saying, as well as on the actual steps of classification, that everything is capitalized other than sick and species. There's a reason for that, and I'll talk about it here in just a moment. We'll fill out our chart that looks like this image over here in just a couple minutes after I introduce why we even have this kind of stuff. You're going to also see the classification of life in different types of formats. One of the more common ones is with the upside down pyramid. Um, and it, it would go through the same type of process as this uh, image that I use over there. So in your book, we talk about Carl Linnaeus. Carl Linnaeus was a scientist. Now, as he was early on in his career, he began to notice that some of the scientists that he was sharing notes with from other areas were talking about the same organisms, but they were using different names than what he used. And that gets really confusing. So, we're going to look at an example. This is not what actually took place with Carl Linnaeus. They were using organism, other organisms. But let's say he was studying a zebra. You and I would call it a zebra because that's its common everyday terminology. However, when you're a scientist and you're talking about a zebra, but someone from a different country was talking about a black and white horse, and then someone from another country was talking about a black striped donkey, and then someone from another country was talking about a white lined mule. It would get really confusing when you think that there's four different organisms or four different types of creatures but when Carl Linnaeus would have been looking at his notes and comparing what he was studying to these other three scientists from other parts of the world, he saw that they were talking about the exact same thing. So he came up with a method of classifying things from big characteristics to individualized characteristics, smaller things that specific things would have in common, and they would become a species. So he came up with these steps starting with from the beginning of understanding that something is alive, going all the way down to a very specific species where they have everything in common. 
So he called a zebra an equus quagga. Now, if somebody would come up to you and say, hey, have you seen an equus quagga lately? You wouldn't have any idea what they're talking about. You're not a biologist. If someone came up and asked me, hey, have you seen an equus quagga lately? I wouldn't have any idea what they were talking about. I didn't know that that's what the actual species name for a zebra was until I looked it up to do this video. But if they can agree upon that everyone will call a zebra an equus quagga, then all four of these scientists would know specifically what they were talking about. So Carl Linnaeus came up with these steps. Now, we have two big fancy words here. Binomial nomenclature. Say that in your head. Binomial nomenclature. Sounds like a wonderful thing to learn, doesn't it? Binomial nomenclature. Now, why is that important? Because... On the I-STEP test, a couple of times in the past six, seven years since we've been testing on science, it has said, identify the steps of the binomial nomenclature. Well, if you see those two words and you have no idea what they even mean, you don't know the steps. But I've also seen questions over the past few years where it gave you the correct order of the steps for the binomial nomenclature, and you had to identify the name of it. So if I saw the steps from life down to species, then I should know it's a binomial nomenclature. We don't get really far into studying what all that the definitions of where those words came from, but it is something I want you to be able to identify. So we have the saying, let's do keep plates clean or family gets sick. This is where your paper comes in handy. I want you to have this paper, and at the very bottom, I want you to write the saying that I've given you, having each word starting with a capital letter, other than the word sick. So at the bottom of your paper, I want you to write, let's do keep plates clean or family gets sick. You can pause the video now and then restart once you have that written down. So that's a saying that should be pretty obvious for each and every one of us to understand. If you do dishes like I do at home, you gotta make sure that your plates are clean. If you have leftover food on your plates and then you put current and new food on it and have people eating, they're going to get food poisoning. They're going to get sick to their stomach. And they may be down for a couple of days because bacteria and fungus will begin to grow in those old food particles that aren't refrigerated and then they're going to contaminate the new food and you're going to get sick. life. So each one is going to be capitalized other than the word species, which is going to be lowercase. So life, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Pause the video and fill out your paper now. So hopefully your paper is filled out because you're going to be able to, or going to need to know that and be able to identify the correct steps on your test and you will have a test over this chapter of our new book so let's look at what this does for us you and I may have a, a specific name that we call things such as a house cat we may call it this a gray wolf and we may call this a house dog but once again what something calls someone calls a dog in Australia might not be the same thing that we call a dog here a dog in Australia may be actually a wild dog or a dingo where we're talking about something that we cuddle up with on our couch. You wouldn't cuddle up with a dingo in Australia, I promise. But with our dogs on our couch, we would. So scientists, have, for every living creature that they have found and continue to find, they come with a, up with a genus and species name. So a house cat is actually a Felis domesticus. So all organisms that are in a cat category start with felis, but then they get classified according to the specific traits about them. Canis lupus versus Canis domesticus are two different things. If I just say that, yeah, I'm going to go outside and play with a Canis, well, then that could be some problems for me because a Canis lupus is a gray wolf. I don't want to go outside and play with a gray wolf. But I would go outside and play with my Canis domesticus, which means domesticated dog, 
or my house dog. So scientific terminology can, was come up with by Carl Linnaeus. He calls it a binom binomial nomenclature. So every person that's studying these animals will know specifically what type of species they're talking about. So let's work through what each one of these steps are. We're going to look at the Canis lupus that I had just said. So the Canis lupus is the gray wolf, but I have to know, according to the binomial nomenclature, how I'm going to end up with the specific name of Canis lupus. So when I look at it, first thing I have to understand is, is it living or not living? The terminology that we used last week was biotic and abiotic. So biotic is a living thing, and abiotic is a not living thing. And we said that there are six things that a living thing must have. Is this wolf made up of cells? Does it have the specific chemicals that are required for it to be a living thing? Water, lipids, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and proteins. Does it use energy? Does it have a metabolism? Does it respond to a stimulus? The things are outside of its body. Does it grow and develop from a baby pup into an adult wolf? And then finally, does it reproduce? Does it create more baby wolves? All of those would be a yes, so I know that this wolf is a living thing. The things that we talked about being abiotic are all of these type of things. We have air or different types of gases, rocks and soil, water, dead decaying animals or dead decaying plants, and then the temperature, a light, and anything that doesn't fall into these categories are abiotic. Once I know it's living, then I can begin to look at, well, what type of cells is it made up of? So we talked about single cells versus multi-cell organisms. We specifically talked about prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. And prokaryotic are all these little single cell microorganisms. And micro means I need a microphone or a microscope, excuse me, in order to be able to see it. It's too small for me to see it with my eyes. Eukaryotic means it has more than one cell, so it's unicellular, and I can see it. Anything that has two or more cells is no, no longer going to be microscopic. There is, they're, they are large enough to be able to see them with the human eye. So when I look at these two categories and I think about my gray or my wolf here, then I know it is going to be a eukaryotic or a unicellular organism. It's more than one. I can see it. From the time that it's born to the time that it's an adult, I can see it so it's not microscopic or prokaryotic. My next step, so it's living. I know its domain is multicellular or eukaryotic. And now I've got to figure out what kingdom it's in. So we have five basic kingdoms that we talk about in science and biology. We have animals, plants, fungi, protista, and monera. Now protistas and moneras are single-celled organisms such as these two here. This is a monera. This is an amoeba. Those are considered living organisms also, but they're one cell. So I know it's not going to be those. We ought to know what a fungi is, toadstools and mushrooms, things like that. It's definitely not it. Plants, we talked about, create their own energy, so they're autotrophs, and the wolf is not it. So when we talk about animals, animals come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, but they are going to eat other living things. They do not create their own energy. They're not an autotroph. They're not a fungi, a protista, or a monera. So we know that the wolf is indeed going to be in the kingdom of animalia, or we just say animals. The next sta stage that we go to then is what phylum is it in? Now we have several different types of phylum that we talked about, talk about or phyla. Now these are not categories that you need to know as a sixth grader. You're going to get into them in seventh and eighth grade, and specifically in ninth grade. But we have all of these different phyla which is the plural of phylum. But we look at this, and it's a chordata. Now, what does a chordata mean? Well, a chordata means it has a spinal cord. It has a backbone. So anything with a backbone is a chordata. Yes, you and I are a chordata as well. 
we so far would fit in ex along with the gray wolf. We are living. We are more than one cell, so we're unicellular, we're eukaryotic. We are in the animal kingdom, and we have a spinal cord. So right now, you and I are the same as this wolf. But I have to keep going then. After chordata, then I look at the class that it's in. Now, my classes are some of the things that you should have learned about in fourth grade, but just to review in case you didn't. We have specific types of living things or living animals. We have fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals or mammalia. So when we talk about us as living things, we are a mammal. When we talk about the wolf, it's also a mammal. So what makes a mammal specifically? A mammal, they have fur or hair. Yes, we have that. They give birth to live young. Yes. They feed their young with milk from the mother. Yes. They have lungs to breathe air. Yes. And they are warm-blooded. So we're still at the same level as this wolf, aren't we? It is indeed a mammal. So are you and I. My next thing in is a conivora. Now conivora is specifically, when I talk about the order, it's going to look at how we obtain our food. So carnivora, it just means it's carnivore. It only eats meats. You're not going to see a wolf going along and eating berries or eating grass unless it has an upset stomach or digging up roots or eating fungi. They are a meat eater. So the other categories that it could be, if it's not a carnivore, then it's an herbivore. And an herbivore eats plants. It eats specifically fruits, vegetables, grasses, um, you know, things like that. If it's an omnivore, which is what we are, so this is where we separate. Omnivore eats everything. It eats meats and we eat plants. There's another category that I mentioned a couple weeks ago that you may not be aware of. It's called a detritivore. And that has been on the ice step test the past two years also. Detritivore is anything that eats dead and decaying organisms. So that's a difference between a scavenger, which eats and tries to find something that has recently died. A detritivore means that it's already dead and decaying. And that's why on decaying trees you see the fungus beginning to grow, or the toadstools and the mushrooms, or bacteria. So detritivores eat dead and decaying things. And they basically recycle the nutrients back into the world. When I go past how we eat or the order, then I'm going to look specifically at the Canidae, which is the family. So notice that all of these other organisms here dropped off. No longer just mammals that are carnivores, but these are specifically dog type things. And when we look at the family of Carnidae, scientifically it says, that it's going to include domestic dogs, wolves, coyotes, foxes, jackals, dingoes, and many other dog-like animals. So when we think of a dog, we think of about its specific characteristics then, we have to then put them into the family of the canine or the canidae. And then when I get finally into my genus, then I drop off this creature over here and this fox down here. So I'm going to specifically start to look at more fine tuned points. From living, which is all sorts of things, all the way down to the genus. And the genus says it contains multiple species, such as wolves, coyotes, jackals, and dogs. The genus is distinguished by their moderate large size, so not really big, not really small, their massive, well-developed skulls, long legs, and a comparatively short ears and tails. So notice that the fox drew, fell off because most fox have really large ears compared to their body size. And wolves don't. They have smaller ears. So that's one of the things that they change. Also with these dogs, we had long, longer legs, or these canine, I should say, and where a fox also has shorter legs, and so do dingoes. So we end up dropping those off. Now we still have four different creatures that still fit into these categories. So then I have to go one step further. I know genus, then it's going to be in the Canis genus, but specifically what species are we talking about? 
And that's when I figure out that we're talking specifically about a, a lupus, which would be a gray wolf. So we went from, I know it's living, it's a multicellular organism that has a backbone, and it is a mammal that eats meats, and therefore it's going to be in the cardidae organism or groups, specifically the canis with the smaller ears and longer legs and moderate body size, and then I identify it as a canis lupus. And a canis lupus is a genus and a species. So each of these categories are going to have capital letters until I get to the species. So Carl Linnaeus, one of the, Linnaeus, one of the things that they decided on the binomial nomenclature is that every scientific name is going to start with a capital letter and identify the genus category. And then the second word is always going to start with a lowercase letter to identify what species we're talking about. So the scientific name, according to the binomial nomenclature that Carl Linnaeus came up with, is always going to use a genus species identification. You and I are homeostasis, or excuse me, homeo sapiens. So we all have the same category, and then sapien means a human being. When we talked about dogs, we had a canis domesticus. Not a canis lupus, which is a dog that is a wolf, but a uh, canis domesticus is a dog that is house trained or house broken. It's welcomed into your home without you having to have fear of it, you know, acting like a wolf. So that is our lesson today, and then tomorrow we're going to get into the second half, which is a dichotomous key, and we're going to answer the questions that are coming up in our book. So there should only be maybe three or four minutes left of class. Sit quietly. Um, as you, If you want, you can go back and begin to read this section because reading it will also help you do your homework assignment, which you will get later on.